Welcome to the Natera Academy Short Take series on NIPT. Natera Academy Short Takes are brief educational sessions to review helpful facts and information for the benefit of our healthcare providers. My name is Russ Jelsma. I'm a maternal fetal medicine physician and the senior medical director for reproductive health at Natera. In this short take, we will explore how knowing zygosity from NIPT results can impact twin pregnancy management. I want to talk about one of my last patients I cared for before retiring from clinical medicine. She had spontaneously achieved twins, had a bedside informal ultrasound performed at six weeks in the emergency department, and was told that she had two placentas. Subsequent ultrasounds performed in her OB's office confirmed the prior dichorionic diamniac placentation. She had a normal ultrasound at 20 weeks, and in 22 weeks, she had preterm contractions and prolapsing membranes and was transferred to my hospital. Bedside ultrasound showed classic stuck twins consistent with twin-twin transfusion syndrome, TTTS. Vaginal ultrasound demonstrated prolapsing membranes into the vagina from the polyhydramnios. She went on to deliver shortly thereafter, and both babies died. Well, some of pathology confirmed monochorionicity and TTTS. Could this have been prevented? We will never know because TTTS can develop within days of a normal ultrasound. However, if she had MFM referral and had ultrasounds every two weeks, she would have had an ultrasound at 22 weeks, and it is likely early TTTS would have been diagnosed and she would have been referred for laser treatment. So, can SNPs-based NIPT improve outcomes for twins? Let us discuss the clinical advantages of SNPs in twins. SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, are the 1% of our DNA that is unique. And I reviewed SNPs and NIPT in my Natera Academy talk what makes the SNP-based NIPT different? Due to SNP analysis, Panorama is the only NIPT that can differentiate maternal and fetal genotypes. The same technology used in our Panorama Singleton screen allows us to provide valuable information for twins. SNPs can also provide information about fetal fraction, the percent of cell-free DNA from the fetus compared to the maternal cell-free DNA. SNPs can also evaluate for vanishing twin and triploidy, and they can evaluate for maternal contribution, for example, maternal 45XO. Fetal sex accuracy. In that regard, please read our recent paper in the May Green Journal, where we demonstrated the benefit of knowing the correct NIPT for gender as regards the diagnosis of disorders of sexual differentiation, such as androgen insensitivity and congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So knowing accurate gender is important. The unique features of Panorama provide additional information for twin pregnancies. These include determining whether the twins are monozygotic or dizygotic. For monozygotic twins, the SNPs are the same and only one fetal fraction is measured. For dizygotic twins, SNPs evaluation provides individual fetal fraction for each twin. As we know, fetal fraction is important to measure and utilize because low fetal fraction results in lower aneuploidy detection rates and is also associated with increased risk for trisomy 13, trisomy 18, and triploidy. Labs that do not use SNPs and provide NIPT testing for twins combine the fetal fractions with the assumption being that they are equal or each represent half of the fetal fraction. Our experience in dizygotic twins disproves this assumption. SNPs also permit the determination of individual fetal sex, whereas non-SNP based NIPT technologies can only determine if both are female or if one is male. Not so with SNPs. This capability of SNPs, which permits differentiation of maternal and fetal genotypes, results in increased test accuracy. All these reasons are why using SNPs result in fewer false positive and false negatives, all of which are of great value to your patients. Moving on to non-invasive prenatal testing, NIPT and twins. This image shows dizygotic twins. Each placenta spills cell-free DNA into the maternal circulation, resulting in a mixture of maternal cell-free DNA and cell-free DNA from each twin. NIPT testing does not separate by source of the cell-free DNA, so all three sources must be evaluated together. This is where the clinical advantage of SNPs helps. SNPs provide differentiation between maternal and fetal DNA, which permits individual evaluation of twins. This SNP plot demonstrates the pattern of monozygotic twins, which is exactly the same as if this were a singleton pregnancy. The SNPs plot shows an upper line, 
three middle lines and a lower line. The upper and lower lines relate to the fetal fraction, whereas the middle lines provide information about aneuploidy. The easily distinguished central three lines on the monozygotic twin plot are much more jumbled on the dizygotic twin plot. As we have said previously, not all SNP profiles are visually conclusive, and this is why Panorama's proprietary computer algorithm is essential. These are our granddaughters in their dance costumes. The two on each side of their older sister are twins. They're almost four years old, and we now know they are dizygotic because of genetic testing they had because their father has a genetic cardiac condition. But before they delivered, it wasn't so clear. Prior to achieving their pregnancy, my daughter was seeing an infertility specialist and was on 50 milligrams of Clomid. Upon achieving pregnancy, she had an ultrasound that showed a singleton fetus, and two weeks later, she had another ultrasound that showed twins with discordant crown rump links and two separate placentas. Because she had only one follicle, the assumption was that the twins were monozygotic, identical. Her pregnancy was complicated by discordant fetal growth, and at 35 weeks, the larger twin had increased amniotic fluid, and the smaller twin had oligohydramnios. Given the assumed monozygotic twins, the concern raised by my colleagues was that we had missed a monochorionic placentation, and this could be late twin-twin transfusion. She delivered, and both babies did well. Placental pathology confirmed dichorionic twins, no twin-twin transfusion. So I tell you this story? Even experienced MFMs can be confused. What is chorionicity? Chorionicity describes the nature of placentation. It is best diagnosed by ultrasound scan at 7 to 14 weeks by examination of the number of placentas, one or two, and if we can visualize only a single placenta, we look at the characteristics of the intertwin membrane. This graph shows monochorionic twins. 20% of all twins are monochorionic, but these 20% result in 75% of all twin complications. The majority of these complications are largely related to the shared single placenta. So, what are the potential complications of monochorionic twins? The one we are most familiar with is twin-twin transfusion syndrome, TTTS. Intrauterine growth restriction, IUGR, oligohydramnios or polyhydramnios, umbilical cord entanglement or compression in monoamniotic twins, increased risk of birth defects, increased risk of congenital heart disease. So, how does determining monochorionicity affect management? Early knowledge allows risk stratification of twin gestations, increased ultrasound frequency every two versus every four weeks, prompt referral for MFM consultation, and it provides for early and regular monitoring for early diagnosis of TTTS and IUGR. However, how good are we at determining chorionicity? This is a paper by Blumenfeld published in the Journal of Ultrasound and Medicine. The title of the article is Accuracy of Sonographic Chorionicity Classification in Twin Gestations. This was an NICHD MFMU network paper, so these were not inexperienced physicians, and the ultrasounds were done between 11 to 13 weeks. Placental pathology, the far left column, was considered the gold standard for chorionicity. Of 90 pathology confirmed monochorionic placentas, ultrasound was correct in 73, meaning that 17 were incorrectly called dichorionic. This means that 19% of these patients would have missed the every two-week surveillance by ultrasound had they been known to be monochorionic. Of the 455 pathology documented dichorionic placentas, ultrasound was correct on 437, but 18% were incorrectly called monochorionic. These patients had twice as many ultrasounds as they needed, resulting in increased costs and, for some patients, increased travel. So what is the impact of late referral for TTTS because of incorrectly assigned chorionicity? We have no published data specific to incorrect assignment of chorionicity, but most twin-twin treatment centers say they commonly see late referrals because of incorrectly diagnosed chorionicity. Here's a paper published last year in the Journal of Clinical Medicine. Validation of a single nucleotide polymorphism based non-invasive prenatal tests in twin gestations. Determination of zygosity, individual fetal sex, and fetal aneuploidy. As regards zygosity, for the 95 samples with zygosity confirmation, 
The paper demonstrated correct calls by the SNP based on FET for all monozygotic and dizygotic twins. Similarly, as regards samples with fetal sex conformation, the gender was correctly called for all fetuses. Finally, as regards samples with aneuploid conformation, all aneuploid and euploid fetuses were correctly called. Given the inaccuracies by MFMs and likely by other healthcare providers, and given late referral for TTTS, you should consider using NIPT for twins as a screening algorithm to ensure prompt referral of monozygotic twins to MFM for evaluation and determination of chorionicity. Doing so will reduce the likelihood of late referral for TTTS and increase the likelihood of successful treatment and improved outcomes for your patients' babies. So SNP technology permits evaluation of vanished twin, triploidy, and maternal chromosome abnormalities. As shown today, SNPs can also help determine zygosity, which can improve pregnancy outcomes. Questions? Visit our website at natera.com to learn about Panorama, a SNP-based NIPT, or call us at 844-778-4700.